hello everyone. Um, I'm obviously going to change tack a little bit. I'm not a policymaker, I'm not in government. What we do is pretty practical. Um, and so what I'm going to do is tell you a story of our creating of conditions um, and kind of just make it really personal, make it kind of really practical for people. Um, and the title of it is Make It Personal, but Don't Take It Personally. In September 2007, the Shuttleworth Foundation and the Open Society Foundation gathered a group of people, many of whom are here today, to really imagine a new future through edu open educational resources. One of the participants of this meeting was a guy called Mark Warner. Some of you may know him as well. I know he's, he's engaged with this group quite a lot. Um, Mark was a master's and PhD student in physics. And as kind of a, a physics student, he really loved science. He also knew quite a lot about science and about tutoring both university students and school learners in finding out about what science really is. Mark experienced this firsthand, that learning science required, it, required some fundamental information and core knowledge, and that this knowledge was simply not available to learners in the South African education system. Firstly, on scale, but secondly, also at the level that they needed to engage with science. Not only was it not available to the learners, it was not even available to the high school teachers. And they were struggling to even engage with some of the basic concepts. So, being a, an advanced student and a pretty confident guy, Mark believed that, firstly, this was a great injustice, and secondly, it was very easy to solve. All he needed to do was write down everything that he already knew. <coughs> so, he actually set out to do that. And um, to his great surprise, it took him longer than a weekend. You know, he thought, oh, well, I'll quickly get it down, and, and it didn't work that way. And he realized he needed support, he needed more people to participate, and it wasn't just about the resources being openly licensed, but he needed more people to engage in this and to collaborate around it. So what he did is he looked to the well-established model of free and open source software. The values of openness and freedom translated well to teaching and learning, and the methodologies of sharing, collaboration, and remixing was just what he needed to get the job done. And so he got started. And what the result was was a complete set of textbooks for maths, chemistry, and physics for the South African school curriculum released under an open license, a true set of OERs, even though he didn't even know the term. By the time he participated in the Cape Town Dec Declaration, which was the meeting of minds to do this envisaging, um, the books were all but done. It had taken him a couple of years, but it actually gathered a community of teachers and advanced students who were willing to share their knowledge towards developing these resources that can be freely shared with anyone in the world, edited, adapted, and reused. It was based on this experience that Mark came to the Cape Town meeting, knowing that OERs was not, was not only possible, but it was essential. And the problems in the inherent system had already created some of the conditions for that innovation to happen. Um, so if, for the guys who want to go, who are online, you can go to capetowndeclaration.org. And at this meeting, we imagined as a group the, the shift we would need in the education resource ecosystem to realize the full potential of OERs. It's clear that OERs are much more than the individual projects and initiatives that we implement. It's a reimagining of the educational resource ecosystem and requires a shift in thinking and action on the part of each member of that ecosystem. And the three strategies emerged from the Cape Town Declaration, and I'd like to read them in full because I think they're quite important in describing the kinds of behaviors that we're looking for. The first strategy was aimed at educators and learners. We encourage educators and learners to actively participate in the emerging open education movement. Participating includes creating, using, adapting, and improving open educational resources, embracing educational practices built around collaboration, discovery, and the creation of knowledge, and inviting peers and colleagues to get involved. Creating and using open resources should be considered integral to education and should be supported and rewarded accordingly. The second strategy was aimed at open educational resources themselves. We call on educators, authors, publishers, and institutions to release their resources openly. These open educational resources should be freely shared through open licenses, which facilitate use, revision, translation, improvement, and sharing by anyone. Resources should be published in formats that facilitate both use and editing, and that accommodate the diversity of technical platforms. Whenever possible, they should be able so they should also be available in formats that are accessible to people with disabilities and people who don't, do not yet have access to the internet. 
And the third strategy was aimed at open education policy. Third, the go government should bo school boards, colleges and universities should make open education a high priority. Ideally, taxpayer-funded education resources should be open education resources. Accreditation and adoption processes should give preference to open educational resources. An educational resource repository should actively include and highlight open educational resources within their collection. These three strategies are pretty all-encompassing, but of course, they're very difficult for one entity to implement. And what's really important is to think about this as an ecosystem and that each person has a part to play. And so what did we do to really bring about this shift in individual behaviors that we were looking for? Education has needed fixing for a long time. And there's a lot of noise in this space. There's a lot of activities. There are a lot of things that vie for the attention and the thinking and the, the commitment of teachers, learners, parents, school boards, and policymakers. And we're looking for systemic change through a shift in individual behaviors. So the only way to spread ideas beyond the early adopters and scale OER as a viable alternative to lockdown resources is to focus on creating the right conditions for the ecosystem to shift and flourish in the new change conditions. A connect in rather than a connect out model. So it was with this in mind that we joined forces with Mark and his free high school science text and decided to, put, to practice what we preach and actually do an experiment on how this would look. Again, going through the three different um, groups that the Captain Declaration was aimed at, firstly, educators and learners. It's not enough to just post resources under an open license online. We want teachers and learners to actively engage and participate. And how do we do that? By showing them how. You know, it's a new concept for them. They, they think about education in a specific paradigm, and what you need to do is you need to help them shift that by telling them, act now and this is what you do. We show each teacher the benefits, we make it very personal to them and say, this is how you participate and this is what you will gain. Um, and then of course we make it incredibly easy for them to participate. We use technologies that um, take the activity to them, including mobile access. We make sure the technologies are easy to use and does not offer unnecessary bar um, barriers to entry. We offer as much interoperability as possible by making the resources available in remixable and adaptable formats, and we make the rules of the game very simple, with clear licensing agreements and options for them to choose. And last but not least, we provide a human interface, a point of reference and contact for them if they wanted to get started. Secondly, open educational resources. We made sure that it was immediately useful to South African teachers. Um, the previous speaker spoke about how difficult it is to, for teachers to choose the resources that they need. You know, the, when they venture online, they find a lot of things that aren't relevant to them. We make sure that it's immediately relevant. We started off by making sure there's something for everyone. We didn't create all of it. We started with a free high school science text. We procured some resources for grade one to nine. We used some of the existing resources that are available online and localized and customized those, including some of the ones that have been mentioned, the Khan Academy and the FET simulations. And we included those in our resources to make sure that we have an holistic offering and that when someone chooses to make that shift, there was something there for them to offer them value. Thirdly was the policy space, which was a little bit more difficult for us to venture into, seeing as we were really focused on the practicalities. But by the time we developed an obvious use case for policymakers, it was easier for them to engage with what this thing might look like, for them to envisage this world of open educational resources and what they would mean for an education system like South Africa's. We've now been approached by the Department of Education based on the fact that they've seen our work, as opposed to that we've spoken to them about changing their policy and asked us to advise them on how they do things around educational resources, how open educational resources might be integrated into the education system, and how that might be included in their um, open education portal. To make it a bit easier, apart from just trying to shift policy, we also try and work with policy. And what we will do in this coming year is to make sure that the resources that we have interface properly with the procurement system that the Department of Education has and to make sure that we free our budget and we free our, free our procedural time for teachers to be able to access resources and not have to search for them online. So this combination of strategies is best, best categorized by our, what is now our Sia Vula catalog. 
We are integrating an open assessment bank, slides, videos, simulations, and citizen cyber science opportunities into collaboratively authored curriculum aligned OERs that are available online via mobile and in hard copy print format and will be submitted to the government approved list for approval and purchasing through their purchasing process. And to support this, we're also rolling out a range of courses to support educators in taking, taking maximum advantage of opportunities for collaboration, tools, and technology in their classroom. And what's really important about this process is that it's a, it's a self-selecting process. So people who have the spark, people who feel interested, are then ushered into this process in an easy way. And we then, of course, believe that they bring their networks and their, their social environments with them. So we've now started to see the shift. But how are we going to sustain it? Um, and we believe the only way to do that is for the market to pick this up. As foundations and as governments, you can do a lot to really create the environment. But when you're looking for action, you're looking for people who, for whom it matters. And it has to matter for them philosophically, but it also has, has to matter for them in their own livelihoods and the work they do every day. And so Sivula is being set up as a, an income generating social enterprise by Mark Horner, and we're supporting him in that process. Because we were in the position to have the content, expertise, tools, and people to wrap this up into a holistic offering under the Siavula banner, and to be able to offer a practical implementation of what OERs are and help teachers engage with that. So I focused a lot about Siavula, because you know, Lisa specifically asked me to tell you the Siavula story. But we don't only support Siavula in this space. We also have other investments and other initiatives and other thinking that we're supporting two of which are here, and the first is Philip Schmidt from the P2P University, the social rapper for OERs, as he first introduced it, um, now also exploring alternative le learning recognition through badges, and Cathy Fletcher, previously from Connections, working towards an open API for OER platforms for maximum interoperability and reuse. So what was the part about not taking it personally? Well, that is really about focusing and developing our own initiatives, but realizing that we're part of a bigger ecosystem and we can't possibly get to everything. And everyone else is part of this community with us and working towards similar goals as set out in the Cape Town Declaration. So we don't take it personally if someone don't choose us. What we want is them to choose OERs. And believe if we do our bit to create the right conditions with each of the individuals in mind, the community will connect in. And so what I'd like to do is thank those people here today who've contributed to our efforts, knowingly and unknowingly, and also to those who build towards this envisioned ecosystem, because I think, I think we can see it today. Thank you.